There are two teams, the government which affirms or upholds the resolution, while the loyal opposition negates the resolution. The government is represented by the prime minister and the member of government, while the opposition is represented by the leader of opposition and the member of opposition. Each speaker presents an argument for their supporting side, and in the end, the prime minister and the leader of opposition will provide rebuttals stating why their side wins. At the end of the debate, you, the audience, will decide who wins. Now this event is one in which the audience participates. So if you hear an argument that you like, you are welcome to tap on your lap or tap your feet or say here, here, when you hear an argument you like. For example, cookies are delicious. So on the opposite side, if you, on the opposite side, if you hear an argument that you don't like, you're allowed to say boo or shame. For, so if I say, we should replace all cookies with oatmeal raisin cookies. See? A lot of people don't like oatmeal raisin cookies. Personally, I want to just distribute lettuce and old tomatoes so you can just chuck them up there, but no. Apparently janitorial staff doesn't like that. Our debaters this evening uh, representing the government are Alice Hoover and Maria Alejandro Jaramillo. And on your opposition, Re Rebecca DeSantes and Desney Smith. Alice is a second year student and a state champion in the NFA Lincoln Douglas debate. Maria Alejandra, along with her debate partner, partner Remington, from whom you heard earlier, were both quarter finalists at their very first tournament this last weekend. Rebecca and Destiny are brand new members of the team and were octave finalists at the last weekend's per tournament, hosted by the University of Pacific. <coughs> with that, debating tonight's topic, trigger warnings do more harm than good. Please welcome our Alice, Maria, Alejandra, Rebecca, and Destiny. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for staying with us the entire night. Uh, we are representing the affirmative, and the resolution for today is this house believes that trigger warnings do more harm than good. This is going to be a value round because what we're trying to do is evaluate whether trigger warnings are uh, better, if they do more good, or if they're harmful for students. The definitions we'll be dealing with today are uh, this house is going to be Solano Community College, Trigger warnings is going to be uh, a statement at the beginning of a class, lecture, or course alerting students that it may contain potentially distressing material. And uh, for the phrase more harm than good, we're looking at academia only, not internet, not anything else, only when it comes to school. Our value for today is going to be education. Our criteria is going to be whoever best upholds value of education. And our burdens are that, as the government team, we must show that trigger warnings do more harm than good, and the opposition must show that trigger warnings do more good than harm. So let's get right into it. Our first contention is that it increases closed-minded attitudes. Our thesis for this is that by having trigger warnings, it makes students less open-minded about topics that encourages closed-minded attitudes. Our first point, for example, that the Huffington Post on May 20th said that students can get up and leave if they want to be close-minded about a topic when trigger warnings are used in classes. We have another example of Galileo, for example, when he came up with the, the theory that the sun um, doesn't revolve around the earth, the Catholic Church decided to put him on house arrest because they didn't want to deal with it. So this is a perfect example of when people want to be close-minded about something, they just shove it to the side and they don't deal with it. We don't want to do that. Our tie back to this is that trigger warnings lead to decreased education because they encourage close-minded attitudes among students. Our, third, our second contention is that it decreases um, academic freedom. Our thesis for this is that professors are not able to be as flexible in their class time and that decreases academic freedom for both the professors and the students. Our backing point number one is that according to the New York Times on May 17th, Rutgers uh, University has suggested trigger warnings for books 
uh, for English teachers, for example, Huckleberry Finn, trigger warning for racism, um, The Great Gatsby, trigger warning for gore, abuse, misogyny, all of that. Also, our third point is that America uh, Association of University Professors says that trigger warnings will decrease student and teacher academic freedom. There is a second point, but my partner will deal with that. Our tie back is that trigger warnings decrease education because they limit the academic freedom of teachers and students. Again, very harmful. Our third contention is that it decreases student enrollment. Our thesis here is that trigger warnings decrease the number of students signed up for sensitive classes. For example, here at Solano, we have classes such as history of African Americans or the history of women. If we encourage trigger warnings, people are going to want to sign up for these classes because they deal with uh, sexism and racism, and that's not what we want. We want to enroll the more students so they can be more open-minded, so they can have different perspectives about our history and be well-informed. Because if so, if that was the case, eventually classes would be uh, canceled and it would be the students who would suffer in the end. Again, our tie back to this is that trigger warnings decrease education because they decrease students' involvement for classes and that decreases the perspectives and information to them. So again, this is why you're voting for the government because we think that trigger warnings are more harmful than good. anyone flowing, I'm going to be going uh, to the opposition side and then addressing the government's um, uh, contentions here and I will be keeping my time as in rounds. We do have to keep our own time and we're expected to know how long we are taking. So to get this started, I want to thank everyone for being here. It's really actually nice to have an audience for the first time. And moving on to the first bit of uh, information here is that we are going to grant the government's definitions. Uh, their criteria and their value. So moving on to our first counter contention, um, for those of you flowing, our title is PTSD and stigma. Our thesis is that the trigger warnings will apply to students with PTSD and or a troubled past. The trigger warnings will warn them early of difficult materials such as in a syllabus um, and encourage them to seek help deter re-traumatization and eliminate the stigma assigned when they jump up in the middle of class or are leaving the classroom. Our backing is the uni uh, UC Santa Barbara student, um, ba Bailey La Laverne, uh, in the Washington Post in May, made a statement of, we're not talking about someone walking away from something they don't want to see. Students actually perceive a very real threat. Imagine the most terrifying or painful moment of your life, and then imagine reliving it in the middle of class. So, um, these students uh, perceive this very real threat, and student, students who leave when a difficult subject is presented are now publicly declaring their response to the material. Our tieback is trigger warnings allow students the opportunity to remove themselves from a negative situation before it becomes catastrophic. They eliminate re-traumatization in academia by no longer forcing students to sit through damaging material. Trigger warnings also shut the door on an opportunity for bullying, as students will no longer be subject to ridicule for leaving the classroom, all of which will increase student education. Our second counter contention is keeping students in seats. Our thesis is trigger warnings keep students engaged by allowing instructor, instructors free reign, maybe more so with these warnings in place, to material they deem educational. We're not asking that they not teach us, but simply warn us of what they will be teaching. Students who will become uh, or will choose to be in the classrooms and continue to stay enrolled in their classes with better understanding of the course material. Our backing is the Huffington Post reported on Oct in October of 2014 on a college professor requiring students to write about their fantasies and previous experiences, both good and bad. And this professor would dock their grade if their journals weren't in-depth or long enough. No pun intended. Huffington Post Live reported on May 9th of 2014 of a course on human sexuality, where this, in the second meeting of this class, a naked woman demonstrated a vibrating stimulation marital aid. 
Students were unaware and unprepared for this demonstration. Our tie back is, these, this will keep students, trigger warnings will keep students in their seats and engaged by warning them and allowing those interested in subject matter to stay. This won't penalize students who are uncomfortable participating if a large portion of their grade depends on this. Keeping students engaged in the course will increase their education through willingness to participate. Our third counter contention is improved teacher performance. Many of the instructors can say here, part of delivery is overcoming the audience's preconceived notions. Instructors will stretch their understanding of the material and impart this to their students by showing it through different lenses. Our backing is students from several reputable universities have requested more thoughtful treatment of subject matter. Some instructors are doing a disservice to their students by simply slapping them in the face with only one perspective. Our tie back is students will have improved educa education because their instructors will be forced to present material through multiple angles and being aware of the implications and subject matter to the audience. Since students are asking for us to increase their education this way, and they're paying the bill, why aren't we giving it to them? To their first contention, I will say, cross-apply our counter contention to number two. We are keeping students in their seats, plain and simple. They are gonna wanna see this material, and they're gonna stay in their seats. To their second contention, it's gonna decrease academic freedom. I argue our counter contention three, improving teacher performance. Give our students what they're asking for. And finally, to their third contention, they give you no backing. So, you can completely disregard their third contention. Thank you. Okay, quick roadmap for everyone who's flowing. I'm gonna go off case to the arguments that Becky brought up for counter contentions, then I'll go back on case to bring all hundred and my arguments. So, going first on to counter contention one, titled PTSD and stigma. Now, pretty much what they're telling you is that by having trigger warnings, this allows for students with troubled past to avoid these things. And they give you the example of the student from UC Santa Barbara who says, now people aren't gonna get up just because they don't feel like sitting and listening to this, they're only gonna get up if they're actually bothered. However, students currently get up if they don't wanna listen to something and leave. If you give an excuse like a trigger warning, students are only going to be more encouraged to do this. While it is important to have students be able to excuse themselves from these things, many professors are actually very open-minded and willing to work with students if they have sensitive information and sensitivities in regards to these things. Yeah. Having trigger warnings only hurts education because now students have another excuse for, oh, I'm gonna skip class today. I'll just say they were talking about something I didn't want, that I was sensitive to. This is only going to actually harm people who actually have these problems because then it's going to make light of an issue that is actually very traumatizing to them because people aren't going to see PTSD or things like this as important because they think of it as just an excuse to skip class. So you can see this is actually going to hurt education because students will now have an excuse to get up and leave class and they won't take these matters as seriously for the students who actually struggle with these things. Going on to counter contention two, titled keeping students in the seats. Uh, they try to tell you that this gives teachers more free reign and they give you the example of the college professor who had them write about their previous sexual experiences and the naked woman stimulating herself in front of class. Um, here, here. <laughs> neither of these, <laughs> as much as some people might want to see this, uh, neither of these actually deal with trigger warnings, so it's not showing how trigger warning, warnings are actually increasing education. Those are things that teachers can do right now. With the example that we give you with English teachers, if you have a trigger warning, then a teacher has to be very careful when branching out during class. Maybe in English you're talking about Huckleberry Finn and you're talking about the importance of how when Huck Finn starts to use Jim and call him by his name. However, you might have to be very wary and be like, oh, sorry guys, I know you want to talk about this, but we can't because trigger warnings and I didn't warn you about this before, so sorry, we can't do this or people who are sensitive to that type of information have to now get up in the middle of class and walk out. What's that gonna do for a stigma? I don't know about you, but having to stand up in the middle of a conversation and leave is going to be just as bad because now students are going to be like, oh, maybe they left because they are sensitive to this information. And 
that's going to give them an even greater stigma. So you can see this actually hurts education because teachers are now more limited to how flexible they can be in class to going and talking about what the students actually want to discuss and have to stay strictly on whatever they told the students before because they have to give you a plan of, oh, this is what we're talking about today, and they can't branch off from that. Yeah. Going on to counter contention three of improving teacher performance, they say part of delivery is overcoming preconceived notions. However, if you force a teacher to have only one way to approach a subject and they can't go at it from other angles because of these sensitive information and they have to have trigger warnings on every single thing they bring up, then that's going to limit their ability to actually teach and their ability to inform students about the information they want to do. <coughs> Look specifically to the example that Marie Alejandra gives you when she tells you that the American Association of University Professors say that trigger warnings decrease teacher and student academic freedom. At the point where we can't be as flexible and talk about the things that we actually are interested in class, then you can see that's actually going to decrease education because now students are going to be bored, teachers are limited in the things they can talk about, and it's overall insulting teachers' common sense. Teachers who have gone to school for plenty of years know what they should be sensitive about and what they shouldn't be. They have common sense. They've gone through years of training to be professionals. They know how to deal with these topics gently and bring them up in a way that's not going to harm students. With that, you can see that their off-case positions don't really stand. So let's go on-case and once again look at why you're voting for Maria Alejandra and I on the affirmative. Now, on contention one, the only thing they say is cross apply keep students in the seat. However, they didn't really explain this, so let me just reinforce what Maria Alejandra told you. Currently, if students have a closed-minded idea and they don't want to learn about something, such as with the church in Galileo, they're going to put it somewhere where they don't have to deal with it. The Huffington Post even stated that students, if they don't want to listen to something, can just get up and leave. So if we're talking about racism or sexism and someone doesn't want to change their opinion, they can get just get up and leave the class for no reason at all. And they can't be penalized for that at all. So you see this is actually going to increase closed-minded attitudes because if you don't want to listen to something, now you don't have to. And that's why you should definitely keep these things. Um, on contention too, once again, they didn't really explain this. It's been shown by teachers and students that this decreases the academic freedom, so that's another bad thing, and we want to help increase that freedom. And on counter contention three, uh, we give you the example of African American history and women in American history. If students don't sign up for these classes, then they're going to cancel them, and that's a whole new avenue of education that we can no longer have here at Solano because yeah. people yeah. have trigger warnings on these classes. So that's why you should vote for the affirmative team here. Thank you. <laughs> I am going to start with the affirmative and then I'm going to move on to opposition. Um, so starting with the affirmative, um, their contention number one talks about closed-minded attitudes. Um, one of the things they're saying is that what's going to happen is that people are going to get up during class just because they don't want to hear something that's being talked about. This is why we need warning triggers. Because if we have warning triggers, there's no reason for any student to get up during class because they've been warned ahead of time. So it's not causing closed-minded attitudes, it's actually allowing them to be in a classroom and hear all the multiple sides of racism or of some of these kind of tricky subjects, but they're warned ahead of time so there's no reason for them to be traumatized in the situation. The contention number two showing academic freedom. Um, we don't agree with this. The UC Santa Barbara in their resolution that's asking for a trigger warning say that we're not banning the content or excusing students from learning it. This is according to New York Times. So we're not saying uh, don't talk about it. We're not saying take the information out. We're just saying let us know ahead of time. We don't need any surprises. And um, their, counter, their contention number three, they actually dropped in their um, speech, so you can just drop that when the student enrollment was not talked about or brought up again. So now moving on to the opposition here, um, our counter contention number one is labeled PTSD and stigma. So here's the backstory of Bailey Lovren, who actually is pushing for this resolution at UC Santa Barbara. She was a victim of sexual assault. 
and she was sitting in a classroom where they showed a video with a detailed rape scene where she was sitting there reliving the trauma of what she had gone through with no warning. If she got up in the middle of class, she would have had the stigma of being a victim of a sexual assault. This is not okay. It's not okay to put victims who have already gone through so much back through re-traumatization with no warning. We're just saying warn them ahead of time. Bailey doesn't need to be re-traumatized. She needs to know what's going to be presented so that she can prepare herself ahead of time. We're um, saying here that the tie back is when you're in trauma, you're not learning. When Bailey was watching this video, there was no education happening. She wasn't learning anything. She was reliving a trauma that had happened to her. So without warning triggers, you see education decreasing. Our counter contention number two is that it's going to keep students in seats. Really, the simpleness of this is that if you know ahead of time, why would you leave class? There's no reason to leave class. Students um, will choose to take the classes where they know they're, in, they're having information that they're interested in. The problem here that our, our uh, affirmative team was talking about was that teachers know how to deal with sensitive material because they're professionals. Yes, that's true. However, the professor that we talked about earlier, who um, the, the Huffington Post talked about, was having girls write detailed sexual fantasies in a journal. And if they didn't have enough details, he docked their grade. This was not on the syllabus. They had no warning that this was what their grade was dependent on. We need warning triggers so that you don't sign up for a class that requires you to watch a naked woman stimulating herself or sit through a detailed rape scene or have um, journals with your detailed sexual fantasies or exploits. This is stuff we should know about ahead of time. I don't want to sign up for some class and be subjected to stuff that I didn't know I would be subjected to. It's not okay. Yeah. And then our contention, counter contention number three, is that it's simply going to improve teacher performance. We're not saying don't talk about these things. We're just saying think about it ahead of time. Think about how the information is going to affect your students. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So, I only have two minutes, which I would normally have five for this speech, or no, excuse me, four for this speech. So uh, you guys are going to have to hold on tight. I'm going to make it as simple and easy as possible. We're going to go um, to the government side first and then to our side. I'm going to give you your voters as why you are voting for the opposition today. You guys ready? Okay. All right. So first of all, I want to go to uh, their case, or to the government case. On their first contention, they don't give you any backing that this close-minded um, uh, uh, stuff will happen. They don't give you any backing that people are going to close their mind to the material presented to them. They just simply say that it's going to happen. So just throw that one out the window. Our second, or their second counter contention, or their second contention is that teachers will be limited. And to that, I say, who cares? I'm paying the bill. Give me what I am asking for. Plain and simple. To their third contention, I bring up the fact that the member of government dropped this contention. So take that one right off of your flow right now. And not only that, but don't allow the prime minister to bring it up in her rebuttal because it should have been addressed in the member of government speech. So going on to our contentions, uh, PTSD and stigma for our first contention is going to be your first voter. So label your first voter. Don't re-traumatize our students. We are giving them back their education by not traumatizing them or putting them through material that they are not prepared to handle yet. The second voter is stigma. Don't stigmatize our students. We're already having a problem with bullying in the uh, lower schools, such as elementary school, middle school, and high school. Let's not let it carry over to college. Let's let these students thrive in their uh, classrooms and get the education that they're looking for by not stigmatizing them and pushing them out of the classroom. Just give them the warning is all we're asking for. And for your third voter, 
Give the students what they want. Our third contention is simply this. The students are asking for it. The teachers are trying to constrict it and say that it's going to limit their teaching. We say no. It's going to make them expand their teaching abilities and present the information in a whole new light. Give the students what they want. Thank you. for the audience, our opponents, definitely for a good challenge and definitely to my partner. So now we're going to go off case first to talk about their uh, plan and then we're going to go on case to uh, the <coughs> affirmative plan. So their first counter contention was that of PTSD and stigma. Like my partner plainly said, this is just going to give students the excuse to walk out of class when they're going to use what other people do, what other people feel as an excuse so they can get out of class. They're not going to be learning about the stuff that they need to be learning about. Let's face it, the world has some really ugly truths, and we need to be exposed to them. We can't just say, no, I don't want to know about racism. Well, guess what? If you don't know about racism, you're not going to fix it, and that's not what we need in education. Their second contention was that it keeps students in their seats because it hurts uh, education. Again, you're just warning people right there and then, hey, if you want to get out, you can get out right now. If you're sensitive to this, you can get out. Everybody's going to watch that. Everybody's going to see how sensitive people feel, and they're probably going to be mocked. Is that what we want out of our students? No, we want strong students that can face the ugly truths again. So this is actually going to hurt education. Their third counter contention is that it's going to improve the freedom of teachers. We know that's not true. When you are going to limit someone as to what they say, when you are going to limit them with the passion that they can say something, because first, they have to give you an excuse, that's not giving them more freedom, that's hindering the message that is, that is being made. So first, a go again our own case, why you're voting for us, is because our first contention was that it's going to increase close-mindedness. Again, you can't encourage people to just look away when they don't want to see the ugly truth of the world. Guess what? There's still discrimination in this world. And if you don't want to see it and you walk out of class, you never get to learn that it's been in the past, in the present, and probably in the future. So guess what? You're not going to want to deal with it. Our, counter, uh, our contention number two is that it decreases academic freedom. Again, for the students, for the teachers, it's not a good thing. And our contention number three is that it's going to decrease student enrollment in college because they're going to see and pick and choose what classes they want to take. doesn't matter if it's good for them. So guess what? You're going to vote for the affirmative today because we're not going to put up with this bullshit about trigger warnings. But wait, let me do that again with a trigger warning. Now, you're going to vote for us today because we, folks, I'm going to use a bad word right now. So if you're sensitive, please walk out. Is anybody? Okay, like I said, you are going to vote because it's bullshit and it's hindering our students. So what you just saw, it hindered me, it hindered you, and most importantly, it hindered, it hindered the message. Let's vote for us because we want education. who won tonight so if you thought the government won put your hands together and if you thought the opposition won tonight put your hands together one more time government Opposition wins tonight. 